Welcome to the National World War II Museum's podcast series, Service on Celluloid. This podcast is brought to you through the generous support of the Albert and Ethel Hertzstein Charitable Foundation. Each week, our in-house experts sit down with special guests to discuss depictions of World War II on film. Sit back and get ready for a lively debate that will reveal the good and bad of how Hollywood shows the 20th century's most dramatic event. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and digital content manager here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, and our special guests for today's episode are Kate Fitzgerald, distance learning specialist here at the museum. Thanks for having me. Colin Makemson, assistant director of education for curriculum. Aloha. <laughs> and Adam Foreman, student program specialist here at the museum. Hey, glad to be back. Today, we'll be discussing the 1953 film, From Here to Eternity. Film focuses on the activities, lives, and misadventures of several career U.S. Army soldiers based at Oahu's Schofield Barracks in the days leading up to and shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor. From Here to Eternity stars Montgomery Clift as Pruitt, Burt Lancaster as Sergeant Warden, Deborah Kerr, Donna Reed, Ernest Borgnine, and Old Blue Eyes Frank Sinatra as Maggio. From Here to Eternity was directed by Fred Zinneman, produced by Buddy Adler, and based on the book of the same name written by James Jones. From Here to Eternity was a massive financial and critical success. The film was nominated for 12 Academy Awards, winning eight, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Supporting Actress for Donna Reed, and Best Supporting Actor for Frank. Uh, as we do always, and Colin, I'll start with you if you don't mind, because you're right sure. next to me. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, how accurate is From Here to Eternity? I guess in historical terms, really, the accuracy question would only come into the maybe the last 10 to 15 minutes of the movie with the attack on, uh, on Pearl Harbor uh, itself. But sure, the life of a peacetime soldier or NCO could be boring or perfunctory and punctuated by sort of arbitrary cruelty, depending on where you were or who you were uh, in, in the command hierarchy or echelon. Um, but the attack, uh, uh, they got to shoot at, at, at Schofield, um, and uh, that is where the uh, uh, 25th Division, where this make-believe company is supposed to be part of, uh, was headquartered during the war. So the last 10 minutes uh, of the attack, I think, is you know looks really, really good, especially for the time, 53, and that's pretty, pretty early. Mm -hmm. What about you, Kate? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on what we're talking about in terms of accuracy, because the 10 minutes of it is Pearl Harbor, and the rest is set before World War II is happening in the United States. But I was really excited to see that it was at Schofield. I grew up not too far from Schofield when I was a kid, and I was like, hey, those, those buildings, they're still there. And so I was pretty excited to see that a movie was being filmed at the location that it was set at. But you, Adam? Um, I think it was it was especially uh, realistic or, or real or accurate uh, whenever it talks to um, the monotony of daily soldier life. This idea of always having KP duty, always having latrine duty, always just marching and always just drilling and, and just that monotony and, and all the kind of free time that exists in a peacetime army, um, I thought was relatively accurate. I think that I think the soldiers didn't have a whole lot to do outside of drilling and drinking. <laughs> um, and the uh, the other thing, obviously, it was shot on a, on the actual military base, which is really cool to see the old buildings and the and the spaces that you can still go and visit today. So it was a I thought it was a neat a neat twist to it. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the movie's actually. I mean, you're gonna talk about the final ten minutes being the mm -hmm. attack on Pearl Harbor. I think it is done pretty. Uh, you know, we say the attack on Pearl Harbor, but it was actually it was the attack mm -hmm. on it was an attack on Oahu. Sure, uh, Pearl Harbor, of course, is the naval base, and um, Schofield Barracks is not part of Pearl Harbor. But um, it's been called the attack on Pearl Harbor, and that kind of that's a net of everything there, you know. But as far as that is concerned, there are, and we'll get to that, you know, we'll get to that later on. But there are several instances that that are shown in the um, the attack sequence that are that are dead accurate for things that you know i've heard from people and things that i've read from people but even so uh the stuff before which is the vast majority of the movie which is the life of uh, you know of for at that point career army soldiers is pretty i think is pretty accurate uh from things that i've read and things that i was told through interviews and things like that that uh yeah like you said adam there was a lot of monotony and boredom you know because i mean these guys were there and in Hawaii, in Oahu, and there was no war, so they weren't shipping out to go fight, at least not yet. And there wasn't a whole heck of a lot for them to do aside from drill and train. And there was, you know, intramurals like you see in the movie boxing and things like that, and basketball, football, baseball, bands. 
Um, so there was a lot of, I, I wouldn't say there was a lot of free time, but it, there was a lot more free time in 1940 as opposed to 1942. That's for sure. Right. But I uh, thought it was really neat how important boxing was to, to not only the, the boxers and the men themselves, but also to the, the captain who was like, I'm, I'm really counting on boxing to be the, my way to major, you know, and that's, uh, I thought that was really interesting. I don't know how accurate that would have been, but, but I do know that we've, you know, we have pieces in our collection from boxers in, oh, yeah. in the military. Oh yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know how it would have, uh, necessarily, uh, reflected on a man's promotion <laughs> if you would have been, right. you know, coach of the champion boxing team. I don't think that actually occurs. But boxing was a big thing, yeah, and especially for some reason, I've, I've, I've noticed that it was a it was larger in the Pacific for whatever reason. I really don't, I couldn't tell you why. I don't know. Um, but the Pacific Fleet, the United States Navy, Na uh, the Pacific Fleet had a annual boxing tournament. The smokers, there, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, aboard ships, mm -hmm. but even even so, even so, um, with Marines on shore. Um, you know, like a good friend of mine who's passed away now, Mike Mervosh, was the Pacific Fleet boxing champion of 1944. So, I mean, this guy kicked everybody's ass in the Pacific Fleet, if you think about it, if you really want to be accurate. But but he, uh, I mean, he was an amateur boxer and he did that. And that was a big thing. That was a big thing all through all through the armed services and, again, more so the Pacific, apparently, than, than Europe for whatever reason. But um, does the film do a good job of depicting pre Pearl Harbor, we'll say pre-World War II life in Oahu. Kate, what do, you, uh, what do you think about that? I think it does. I actually think back to our D-Day 75 ceremony where we got to meet, I believe his name was Chick, um, and he was a Pearl Harbor survivor and World War II veteran. And he and I got to talking. I spent probably three hours talking to him, and he was talking about life on, I believe it was Wheeler, but it, he was not stationed um, at Pearl Harbor, but he was on Oahu before Pearl Harbor, the attack, and also after. And he talks about the dancing, going downtown Waikiki and dancing at different clubs and having a pretty good time. And I think they did a pretty accurate job of them going out to the social clubs and interacting um, I, I think it was pretty accurate. I mean, Hotel Street, which is now downtown <laughs> Chinatown, which I've been to many times um, in my life. You know, it's a world famous street. And I think it was a pretty hopping place in, in the 30s and in the 40s. It certainly was, at least for the uh, prostitution crowd. Anyway, on Hotel Street, you know, it was uh, it was a red light. district. Not all of it, but there was a certain part of it that was a red light district. And it was, shall we say, popular with the American servicemen in the area. Um I agree with you. I think it does a really good job of that, of showing that pre-World War II, United States Army, World War II life. And that, you know, you, you got you to gotta remember these guys, most of these guys were, well, they were all, well, most of them were enlistees. You know, of course, the draft, peacetime draft was 1940, but so you're going to have a few draftees, but most of them were enlistees. And, you know, these are farm boys and guys from the plains of Kansas who never seen anything outside of the Dust Bowl, you know. And they're sent to this tropical paradise. So it's, you know, their wildest dreams come true for many, 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 many reasons. What do you think, Adam? Um, well, I mean, it's not it's not just the men that were experiencing this, too. I mean, there's this this really interesting kind of subtle story of migration itself Uh running all throughout this film because the the prostitute was from Oregon and the the you know, the, uh, the dance hall girl, the dance hall girl, <laughs> social, <laughs> club. It's a social club girl, <laughs> it's a only establishment. they have dues and everything. You know, she was from Oregon. And then the, the, the leader of that establishment was from somewhere else. I mean, we actually didn't meet anyone in the film that was actually from Hawaii. You know, it was, it was soldiers that were sent there because they had to be, it was officers who, who were sent there because they requested to be, you know? So it was, uh, there, there were several layers of kind of this, this bigger migration story that's going to, Sure. That's going to kind of weave together. And then, of course, at the end, you see them both on the boat going back to the United States, you know, migrating back to uh, a more comfortable, more familiar space. What do you think, Colin? I think the, the filmmakers inform a lot by I'm trying to think if there are any scenes in off the base that are shot during the day. We only see it at night. We see it as a place to go to spend your money, to to drink, to carouse, to fight, to to pick up a pick up a, a women. So I think just seeing it through the lens, like this place only exists as this nighttime realm. Um, uh, it, it definitely has that sort of you know pleasure island adjacent to uh, 
this you know, bastion of strict military discipline. If you can only get a few feet off the base, you know, the world's your oyster with your pocket full of money that you're going to spend before you have to re-enlist. Yeah. And, and to some extent, that that's that's accurate, you know, the nightlife, because, I mean, these are soldiers, so they're working during the day. They got, they got jobs to do, whatever, however mundane they might be, you know, a bugler or whatever it is. They do have jobs to do, so... I think a lot more uh, sailors would have seen activity, if you will, during the daylight because, you know, you got liberty. And most of the time when sailors got liberty, it's, you know, 24, 48, 72 hours or something like that. And, you, you know, the world is your oyster because you've got three days to do whatever the hell you want to do. Whereas soldiers, especially if they're stationed there, at least during that period of time, they didn't have, you know, that much time to go and do what they wanted to do. Got to pack it in. Got to yeah. carry the whiskey in your loose fitting uh, sports shirt or whatever <laughs> Sinatra says. That's right. That's right. Well, um, the film focuses on career soldiers uh, for the most part anyway. Um, do you think it does an accurate job in portraying that lifestyle? I, I, I certainly do. I, I think it does a very good job of that because you got characters like um, Borgnine's character Judson, Fatso they call him in the movie and you got Warden um, Lancaster, Burt Lancaster's character, and even the captain, and I mean even Pruitt, you know, he's a career. One one thinks he's a career. He's a career army soldier, and you know you got guys, uh, and we can again we can get into this in a little more detail in a minute. But you got guys like Fatso who are, well, there's these very out of shape U.S. Army top kicks who've been around forever. These guys have been there, you know, fifteen, twenty, thirty years. And they've only risen to the rank of <laughs> sergeant, which is, again, that's accurate for the pre-war military. You know, you had guys who'd served for a long, 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 long time. And they had only, they were, you know, God, I knew Marines who'd served 10 years before the war. And they were only PFCs when World War, and it wasn't because they were constantly being busted down. It's just that was the size of the military at the time. And there was no room for advancement. Whereas after Pearl Harbor, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, all that changed. What uh, What do you guys think? Um, I actually watched this film twice, and the first time I watched it, I really kept waiting for something to happen. Um, and then, you know, I feel like I missed a lot of the point of the film. It, this film wasn't really about the military or about war or any of that stuff. It was actually about it, like a human condition, just the human condition of what's about to happen, right? Um, so the first time I watched it, I completely missed the point. I, I was just waiting for stuff to happen. So I especially liked that it just had this really human aspect to it. The you know, I mean, of course, it's a, lo a love story. That's the the point of the film. But um, but they didn't shy away from that real human reaction to to being in a space with you know between military and, and peacetime and wartime, you know. Um, so I thought that was really cool. And to go off what Adam said, I think uh, it's a tragedy, uh, and that's really played up. And I like that it's, it definitely, I don't know, perhaps gives a more realistic portrayal of people who chose the military life before Pearl Harbor. It's not sort of, you know, patriotic paragons of virtue going to enlist to avenge Pearl Harbor. It's people who... I don't know, it's like depictions of the French Foreign Legion in movies from the 20s and 30s. This is also a place for people who have nowhere else to go, you know, ne'er-do-wells right. or sadists or people who really need that institutionalized, you know, to being told exactly what to do and when to do it all the time, sort of being this space of, you know, arrested development. Um, but yeah, you can, these are not uh, the people you might see in the Why We Fight series. These are uh, much more three-dimensional characters. And that, that's an excellent point. And that, you know, especially pre-war, you know, these guys weren't in it to serve the country. You know, most of them. I mean, I'm sure there, yeah, absolutely there were some who, who, who did that. Absolutely. Especially the, the academy guys, and, you know, West Point and Annapolis. Yeah, they were there to serve the country, for sure. You got guys like Fatso, and, and he's not there to serve the country. He's there to serve himself. He's there to to get what he wants and, and to get what he can get. And then you got guys like Maggio who who are, you know, he's not a bad dude, but he's kind of a he's kind of a, a, a leaf in the wind. You know, he really doesn't have any kind of purpose or really straight path. He's just kind of there, kind of doing his own thing. And same thing with uh, with Pruitt. Pruitt's a, you know, he's a boxer for sure, and he is a career Army soldier, and he takes great pride in what he does. But he's not there serving the country. He's there to fulfill, you know, a role for himself. 
Well, you, well, I mean, you say that, but whenever Prue had the opportunity to get away, he actually tried to go back. True. That's very true. So, uh, so I don't know if that's... Well, he's a soldier, too, though. You know, I mean, right. he's, not, he's not necessarily serving his country. He's there, and we've said this a hundred times on this podcast alone, is that, you know, those guys are there for each other. They're not necessarily... They're not there for the flag and apple pie. True. <laughs> you know, they're there for Colin and Kate and Adam and everybody around the table because that's who you train with. That's who you live with. And at this point, or at least at that point in the movie, that's who you're going to fight with, too, you know? So. Right. I, I think this movie makes you... Ask yourself the question, you know, who joins the military in peacetime and why does someone join the military in peacetime? I mean, and in 1941, it's peacetime with air quotes because it's not a peaceful world. But going back to the point that Adam said, I also watched this movie multiple times. And the longer I watched it, I was like, I don't think this is a romance movie at, at all. I think this is an epic tragedy of a movie um in the classical sense i mean yeah yeah Yeah. so i really kept asking myself the question in terms of who joins the military in in a peacetime and i thought this this movie really made me kind of think think about that in terms of like we're here for our buddies well in, in some of these instances are we here for ourselves? You know, why, why am I here? Why am I in Hawaii? Hawaii? You know, which is like a foreign country at this time. Um, I'm here for myself. Yeah. And I mean, you know, again, back to your point, you know, well, to everybody's point, really, but especially yours, Colin, is that, you know, this is 1941. Mm-hmm. And, you know, guys like Pruitt had been in there, you know, I forget. He says how long. I forget how long he says. Five, six years. Something like that. So, I mean, you know, he's joining, let's just say 1935. You know, that that's the heart. The Granted, towards the end, but it's still the hard times of the Depression. One's going to imagine he probably didn't have much, if anything, at all. And I knew a lot of guys who joined the service because they joined the service because they could get three hot meals and a new pair of shoes. Mm-hmm. And that, that's the only way they could do it because they couldn't get a job or anything else. And then you got guys like Warden who had been there for a long time, and that's what he was, you know, he was a soldier. And I mean, Pruitt was too, but I mean, you know, you got guys who who joined because they had nowhere else to go, like you were saying. You got guys who joined because they were told by the judge, either you join the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, you're, you're behind going to jail for five years. And I mean, that was a very real thing. And then too, you also got to remember 1941, the, the draft had kicked in the year before. You know, I, I got to figure this. In 1940, the United States Army, the size of the Army was 269,000 plus or minus soldiers. And in 41, after the draft had begun, it was 1.4 million. So, you know, wow. we, yeah, we always say, oh, the United States wasn't prepared for 1940 or for December 7th. And to an extent, we weren't. Obviously, we didn't expect them to attack, but we were preparing for war. We That's why Roosevelt had the draft instituted in the first place. So, I mean, that's, you know, the Army was growing. It was definitely growing. I think we also have to remember that the military can be a family business. You know, if we did a little uh, dive into the characters, even though we don't know any of this, I would probably guess to say that some of their fathers had been in the military. And that's another reason that many, many people go in for the 40s and in 2019. Very, very true. What about the one of the one of the things you see throughout this movie is the hazing of Pruitt of Montgomery Cliff's character. Um, in your opinion and everybody's opinion, would that, um, was that accurate? Do you think that would have been something that these guys, any of them would have had to endure? You know, I think that anytime you have a, a fraternity, like, like the military is, um, you're going to naturally have hazing and bullying and you're going to have dominant characters, um, in units However, what what Prue and ultimately what uh, Maggio went through um, that was really extreme. So I, you know, and I've never been in the military, so I don't really know what you know what happens in in those spaces. But um, but that that seemed a little extreme to me, and they, it might have just been an exaggeration. So I, I don't really know. Um, I would agree with you 100. percent I think that was very extreme. I mean, yeah, do soldiers pick on one another? Absolutely, of course they do. Sure. And I mean, by by its very structure, there are people who are in charge who are there to tell you what to do and not to do. But um, it, would they have you know 
basically threatened a man with his life if he didn't join the boxing team. I, you know, did it happen? Maybe. I highly doubt it, though. Yeah. And was it was it enforced by the CEO of the unit? No. I, I would find that very, very difficult to believe. Um, Maggio, did, did situations like, you know, Maggio had to endure, did that occur? Yeah. But again, to that extreme, I doubt it. I mean, that's murder. Yeah. I mean, a soldier getting beat to death yeah, by another, by, yeah. by a non-com would be, I mean, that would be a really awful thing. That happened in the Japanese army and the Soviet army, but that did not happen right. in the American army. And if it did, that person who did that was in stockade or at the hangman's noose. You know, right. I mean, honest to God. So yes. that's... Go ahead, Kate. I would say there's a lot more murder in this movie than I anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, I mean, there's what, two, two, two or three? Two. two or three, two. Yeah. Right. The, the, well, Maggio and then the, the stockade so. yeah. commander. Yeah. Well, yeah. And so. Pruitt, I guess it's not a murder. Oh, right. Yeah. He does, yeah he so does it's almost three. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, it's very, the, the hazing, it's, it's, that's like the, the end result of a really cynical system. It's, it's almost when he, when uh, Pruitt ar- arrives, it's like first day in prison talk. It's like, you know, you can't get by by yourself. You got to get along to get along. And, you know, if you do this, you'll be on easy street. And if you don't, it's going to be real hard. You're going to get the treatment. It's going to be really hard for you. And it's just, there's, there's no hint of a meritocracy. It's everything's like networks of personal patronage. And it's like, you know, being in prison or serving in a royal court, you got to keep so-and-so happy so they can keep another person off your back. It was, it was, it was yeah, very discouraging and sort of dispiriting to watch. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, Colin. I, I don't necessarily think that uh, that what is actually portrayed in the film to, to the extreme that it's shown is is remotely accurate, frankly. Yes, there was hazing. Yeah, sure, there was bullying. I mean, that, that happens every day anywhere. I mean, it is what it is. But to that extreme, no, no, I, I don't buy that for a second. I think it's Hollywoodized. Or if it did, it was in sort of controlled settings like images we've seen of, you know, like crossing the line ceremonies of, of, sure. of, of guys, you know, That's more tradition, being, you, know, you know, being, you know, uh, having their head shaved or made to, you know, sort of, you know, take their licks. Yeah. Oh, and right. Yeah. The shell back. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And I mean, that's, that's, that's more, well, that is naval tradition. You know, that's something that I don't, I think they still do to some extent today. Do they not? Kate, your dad was a so, recently retired Marine. He's gonna, hopefully he doesn't hear this. <laughs> we have pictures of him in the 80s, which I didn't know what they were when I was looking at them as a kid. They're Polaroids. <laughs> and I looked at them again after I started working here. And I asked him, I was like, what, what is that? And he was like, that is a shellback 80s style ceremony. And it is, it, it's, I wish I hadn't seen it. Put it that way. <laughs> it's really bad. Um, That's I, awesome. I know, though, that cell phones have changed mm-hmm. things because yeah. this was Polaroids. This was like 1986, I believe, is when he went through it on a Mew. But um, they still do it. I have friends who are my age who were Marines um, that have been in Mews that have done it for sure. But they're really careful not to take pictures anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there's pictures, plenty of pictures of Pollywogs and Shellback uh, initiations, you know, from the 30s and in World War II, you know, and they're 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 pretty gnarly when you look at that. They're awesome, frankly. You know, they're they're really really cool. So I mean, yeah, there was hazing, and yeah, I mean, and again, like I said, that's naval tradition. I mean, that's something that had been going on for you know a couple hundred years. Centuries. So I mean, it's nothing new. Um, I don't necessarily think it's you know a bullying thing or anything. It's just it's just tradition. It's just one of those things that you might not want to do it, but you just you do it. And getting back to Maggio. Uh, which, of course, is Frank's character here, Frank Sinatra. Um, you know, the experience of him in the stockades, I mean, yeah, I mean, I forget, w- what does he get arrested for initially? Do you recall? Well, he, uh, he abandoned his post. That's right, that's right. He goes AWOL. Yeah. He goes AWOL. So, you know, somebody going AWOL and getting thrown in a stockade, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that, that's that's what a stockade is for, is to, to, you know, counteract that sort of behavior. But then when he gets in there, and he's already had that run-in with Fatso before in the right. bar, when they go at it and, you know, I think Fatso breaks a, a beer bottle or a wine bottle or a whiskey bottle or something, you know, going, he's going to go kill him is what he's going to do. And uh, Yeah, that was whenever Fatso was commenting on, uh, his sister. on Frank Sinatra's sister. Yeah, um, not Frank Sinatra, well, Maggio's sister. Maggio, yeah. And, um, yeah, and the, the fight happens in, in the middle of the bar. Right, yeah, and then Fatso says, I'm going to get you one day or whatever it is, you know, right. whatever he says to him. but. But I mean, again, you know, he's he's the sergeant of the guard, and he's in charge of everybody in there, and he's basically got free reign to do whatever he wants to the prisoners in the stockade. No, this is not medieval times, and this is not gonna, that's not gonna fly. 
I did read, though, that after the movie, Fatso and Frank Sinatra became pretty good friends and they stayed in contact because they're both like Italian Americans Mm -hmm. and they wrote Christmas cards to each other, which I just thought was so funny. And they and they signed them Fatso and Maggio wow. when they sent them to each other. <laughs> and, yeah, some Dean Martin celebrity roast, like he came out dressed like as Judson into like you know sort of haze and like terrify Sinatra. Like you know, I don't know how many decades later, oh, I, I didn't find any details, but that's awesome that they were stayed close, but also like an in joke between themselves. Yeah, you think uh, you think Fatso also had connections to the mafia? Hey, yeah. they proved a- that wasn't allegedly. true. <laughs> allegedly, alleged, allegedly, <laughs> alleged connections. Don't be listening, hopefully. But anyway, um, when talking about Pearl Harbor, and again, I just say Pearl Harbor as the the, gen- the, the general net for the attacks on Oahu, uh, most conversations lean towards, and rightfully so, towards the destruction of the American Pacific Fleet in the actual harbor itself. Yet this film goes the other way, and we focus, obviously, on the United States Army, specifically at Schofield. Um, how do you, in your opinion, guys, and, and uh, we'll all comment on this one, but how did the, the attack affect the Army's operations in, in the Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, Oahu area? And if, if uh, I'll go ahead and I'll take this one off. Um, what they show in the movie is fairly accurate, you know. I mean, and we'll, you know, we can talk about the attack now. You know, when the, when the Japanese came over, a lot of these guys were at breakfast, they were at chow, or they were doing PT, or they were sleeping which is something that they do show, you know, throughout this film. And when the Japanese came over, um, you know, they had no, well, they had very few weapons and they, what weapons they had, you know, O3 Springfields, you're not going to bring down a Japanese Zero or a Val right. with an O3. I mean, unless you're incredibly lucky. And, you know, there are lots of stories of guys busting open the armory, literally taking rifle butts or baseball bats or fire axes and breaking open the armory because the the man in charge, the sergeant in charge, wouldn't hand over the keys because he didn't have the proper orders. Meanwhile, they're under attack. And this is shown in the movie. Mm-hmm. And it's shown very well because it did happen. And guys, you know, literally throwing them out of the way and busting the, the armory open with an axe and grabbing BARs in 1919s and 1917s and going at it. Uh, and I think the movie does that very well. And what it else, what it also, also does is it, and this is kind of a little bit eh, but they show towards the end, which would be one would be the night of December seventh. When you imagine it to be, um, they show these guys in machine gun nests and fighting positions on what one assumes to be Waikiki or, or the beach itself, and that did not necessarily happen in that way. They had uh, soldiers and Marines stationed all through Oahu and Honolulu to ward off the impending Japanese invasion, which they thought was going to occur. But the vast majority, I I found this out in later years, the vast majority of the Tropic Lightning of the 25th that was in Schofield were sent up into the hills. They were sent up into the mountains to ward off against a Japanese paratrooper attack, which was they were convinced was coming that night. And so it was far different than the experience that you commonly hear about in regards to Pearl Harbor, whereas, you know, you got all these sailors who were struggling to get back aboard ship or struggling to survive because their ship was destroyed or helping get people out of the overturned Oklahoma or the Oglala or whatever it may have been. And it's, it's a far different story. And because of the massive destruction in the harbor, you don't hear much about it. But these guys were terrified. You know, I mean, these are green. They're all green. Even if they've been in the Army for 30 years, they'd never heard a shot fired. Well, 30 years, maybe. <laughs> they might have right. heard World War One, But... Very few, I should say, have heard a shot fired in anger. So they're all apprehensive and scared about what's going on. And, and you know, I think the movie does that pretty well and that it depicts the, the confusion, the fear, and really, especially the civilians, the abject, you know, you see Donna Reed, you know, don't go, don't go back. And he's t- she's talking to Pruitt because she knows what's she knows what's going to happen to him ultimately. But there's also that fear of what the hell's going on here. And I think that's portrayed pretty well in this flick. What do you guys think? Um, I think you answered most of the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, one other point that I do want to bring up is 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 that you're right that the United States was preparing for war, and um, the film kind of touches on that briefly whenever Prue goes back to the the red light district, and then that, and then the you know uh, Lorraine actually turns him away because she says, "Well, this new unit just arrived today, you know, so we're you know we're booked. We can't have anyone else in here, you know." So. Um, so the, it kind of just very briefly touches on that, but it, it you know, we the United States was certainly preparing for war, um, and they assumed that it would be war with Japan. So we were preparing. Uh, the United States was. So um, I, I especially thought it was cool that they showed um, 
kind of the chaos of the attack, the men running around, the men, you know, dropping pots and pans and, and trying to, to get out into the field to, to help. Um, I was most surprised that they used actual footage um, from the attack. That's That really surprised me a lot um, because of how close it was to the end of World War II being filmed. Um, it, it really surprised me. That's, you know, it's, it's like, you know, a few years ago there was this big uh, controversy about this movie coming out about 9-11 that was um, using actual footage from 9-11, and there's a big controversy around that. So I was really shocked whenever they used actual footage from uh, Pearl Harbor. Shocked in, shocked in what way, though? As in, it, it, it caught me off guard. It surprised me. Um, I didn't expect them to use actual footage because it was filmed so... I mean, this was 1952, 1953. 52 so, when they filmed it. Yeah, so, I mean, so you're... You know, so this is relatively close. It's 11 I mean, years. Yeah. yeah, you know, and there's there's a living memory still there, and there's people who, you know, who were living on the island that, that experienced that, that, that time, you know, so it, it really kind of shocked me. I mean, that can... You know, just like the controversy with using that 9-11 footage in that movie that came out several years ago. You know, it's, it's that, that same idea. I, th- I think it, you know, I mean, the archival that, that, that you see in it, it's, it's the same stuff you see all the time, really. I mean, in newsreels and things like that, most of it anyway. And some of it, too, some of the stuff that you do see in there is actually, it's staged footage. It's stuff that, if, if I'm not correct, somebody, I'm sure, will call me out on it, but I'm fairly certain I'm correct. It was stuff that was shot by John Ford by John Ford for his movie December 7th. Um, and, you know, again, it's it's archival air quotes here, archival, but it was all staged footage. Not all of it, but but some of it was staged footage. And I think, I'm just guessing here, I don't know for, for any certainty, but I'm guessing that it was done for cost. I could be wrong there. Because, I mean, they did have a lot of shots where actors are, you know, I mean, uh, I, it's not Lancaster, but one of one of Lancaster sergeants knocks down a Japanese, well, quote, Japanese airplane, right. quote. And, I mean, that's, he's ripping on that 1919 he's blasting away and there's guys shooting up with bars and everything else and those are real airplanes flying through they're not real zeros but they're real airplanes flying through so they did spend some money on that right you almost got to kind of wonder if they shot the works on on blank ammunition uh, rented bars and and, and and the training and airplanes. snjs yeah <laughs> yeah yeah snjs and at6s so you know i, I don't know i thought it was kind of cool i thought it, it was well placed what do, what do you guys think uh yeah the uh, for the use of the the, the footage, um, I, I think I'm echoing you know, what Kate said. I'm just knowing that you know being able to shoot on location and not just soundstage, uh, and you know those the barracks buildings are so iconic. We see them and you know in, t- in, in tons of you know still and moving images, and just being able to be there and not you know on some you know western style you know stage front or uh, or saloon front uh, really sort of you know for me more so than the the, the stock footage uh, that sort of made it seem real. Yeah, if you go to some of those uh, buildings today on Schofield, they still have bullet, bullet holes, holes in mm-hmm. them from from World War II. That's also, so cool. I couldn't figure out, but you know, a lot of these movies um, they use extras that are active duty people, and I couldn't find anything to see if this movie hmm. used soldiers on Schofield in 1952 as the extras. But I'm I'm gonna guess. You know? I would say that it's certainly, you know, there's some there's some scenes in there where they show the parade ground. Right. And there's a lot of guys out there. Yeah. I'm going to say those are going to be U.S. Army active duty soldiers. And then the, and then the attack scene where there's, you know, it looks like somebody kicked over an anthill. Right. Again, I'm going to say that those are probably active duty. But the rest of them and maybe even some of the guys in the bars and things like that. And I don't know. And again. I apologize, but I don't know like where those scenes were filmed. I'm going to assume that they were filmed in Hawaii, but I don't know, like the bar scenes and stuff like that, you know. But um, getting back to Schofield, you know, I mean, it doesn't hurt either that the buildings are absolutely beautiful. You know, I mean, they don't build U.S. Army barracks like that anymore. Right. When, when were they built, Kate? Do you know offhand? I don't, but I know that a lot of the housing built, like the housing that I lived in on Pearl Harbor, which I think was built around the same time that Schofield was built in, um, was like the late 30s because mm-hmm. it was all there during the attack on Pearl sure, Harbor. Yeah. Did you live on Fort Island? I did. Oh, I yeah, did. Yeah. Um, on the, you can see it's near the John Wayne house, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can see it from the USS Arizona. It's yeah. right in the backyard. Yeah, I've, I've been to Fort Island and I've seen those houses. And I mean, you can take one look at them and you can tell those suckers are not new. You know, yeah, and I was living them in the 90s. <laughs> it's cool, though. It's, <laughs> it's really, really cool. Lived in, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, when this film was released, it was seen, at least partially, as an indictment on commanding officers. Do you agree, Adam? What do you think? Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's, it's actually kind of surprising how quickly that trope kind of developed after World War II, this idea of a bumbling commanding officer, not really in charge, but he has the right, you know, bars on his uniform, you know, um, and relying very heavily on um, the non-coms under him. Um, and that trope we see most often in um, anti-war movies, and this is not an anti-war movie, I don't believe, but it's, um, you know, we see that kind we'll of trope. We'll debate that later. <laughs> <laughs> we see that trope come along um, later during, especially during the Vietnam era, whenever you see that in almost every war film, there's this kind of idea of the bumbling commanding officer who doesn't really know what's going on. Uh, so it's kind of surprising to see it in 1950, uh, you know, 1952. Um, but yeah, absolutely. This is this is absolutely a conversation about effectiveness of commanding officers. I don't know if I necessarily label the captain as bumbling. I'd say he's clueless and, right. he, and he doesn't care because he's got his own agenda. You know, he doesn't care about those guys any more than, you know, I care about kicking over an anthill, like I was saying. You know, I mean, he doesn't care about those people. He's too worried about his, well, his dates, you know, with, with, with his extramarital friends. Right. And, but, you know, to your point, the book was written by James Jones, who was a veteran. Mm -hmm. And if I was to guess, if you've ever read the book, and I, I have, if you've read the book and uh, Thin Red Line, which he wrote, you know, and there's, there's instances in there in Thin Red Line where he... Uh, you know, this is the bumbling commanding officer, as you say. Right. Or, you know, it might be a reflection of James Jones's own personal experiences. You know, I mean, I don't know who his commanding officer was. He might have been a might have been a tool, you know, for all I know. Or or he might have just disliked the guy intensely. And I mean, you know, you got to understand it, too, from an enlisted man's point of view. More often than not, they're not going to necessarily be overly fond of their officer. Um, especially, you know, if the guy is a martinet and he's, you know, running people through the meat grinder without taking risks, which is a, exactly, for all intents and purposes, what the captain in this film is doing. Right. You know, he's leaving the unit to be run by the sergeants, and we all know that, that military units are run by the NCOs, I mean, to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, but it's so neat to see the evolution of that of that that really old trope that we can see no all doubt. the time, you know, to see it starting right there in the 50s, right after World War II, as as just, okay, the commander who doesn't do anything but doesn't get in the way all the way up through, you know, films that now, we've talked yeah. about here yeah. um, that that really are that bumbling commander trope. <laughs> trope, yeah. <laughs> I said trope three times, so That's I okay. figured we'd... Speaking as a middle manager, I found this movie to be very unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but no, it's it's for any organization of any size, you know, hierarchy and bureaucracy are, are going to become necessary. But it, it also those hierarchies and bureaucracies are very susceptible to certain people who see that, oh, I can get in right here and I've got people above me and below me and I'm I can I can I can, I can just cruise because mm -hmm. if it, something happens on my watch, I can uh, blame it on somebody else. But if something else, you know, goes very well, that was all me and all my vision. Man, I have heard that for years. <laughs> I, I feel like in movies, often officers kind of either go one or two ways. Yeah. They're either the complete bumbling idiot that everybody hates, or they're the awesome heroic officer, you know, that, that everybody ends up looking up to yeah. at the end of the movie. You know, I guess that's probably just for Hollywood, but often you don't get the boring middle manager, which probably a lot of them fall into that category rather than agree. the other two, which I think this uh, captain, they did a relatively good job of putting him somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I mean, he's 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 kind of just, he's there, but he's not really there, you know? I mean, literally, I mean, every time he seems to be in the frame, he's boom, he's gone within seconds. You're sergeant, you take care of it. And <laughs> he's just, he's here one minute and gone the next. Well, I mentioned James Jones, and of course he, he wrote the book. Um, there are some differences between the book and the movie. Um, how does the film compare to the book and its other literary or origins? Kate, can you can you answer that? Yeah, so I think to start off with, they had to make some serious changes for the movie. A lot of it, I think, was cost, but even more so was the fact that the army said no to many, many things that were in the book. Because the book is kind of scandalous at, at points, way more scandalous than the beach scene even. Um, but the army said that you couldn't see any hazing. 
you could know what's going on in the background, but you couldn't see any actual hazing in the movie. Um, and I think also that the captain had to resign instead of being promoted, which he definitely gets promoted in the book. Donna Reed's character, uh, Lorraine, in the movie, she is a dance hall girl. She's a hostess or whatever you want to call her. Uh, and in the book, she's a, she's a pro. She's a prostitute. And uh, I, I read that too, Kate, that, <laughs> that the censors are like, eh, let's not make a prostitute the, the heroine of the movie. And then um, Deborah Kerr's character, she is, you know, an, an adulterous female. Good God. Oh, you know, even though her husband's a louse, you know, but uh, that that was a point of contention as well. I know. W- what do you think, Adam? Um, you know, the even the title um, from here to eternity references a, a, a poem uh, called Gentleman Ranker. And that's from uh, the Victorian age. It was written by a, a British poet. Yeah. Um, yeah. And. Um, and in the poem, it's it's the poem is all about regular soldiers who, at some point, lose their way, and one soldier is lost to love and truth, one soldier's lost to drunkenness, and one soldier's lost to death itself, and um, the film follows that same kind of cadence with the sergeant being lost to love, with Maggio being lost to to drunkenness. And Prue being lost to to that very lonely death out on a beach by himself, right? Um, and of course, the film really continues that same theme of the lost, um, with the lazy quartermaster and the angry boxers and the angry prison keeper and the vengeful, um, you know, the vengeful boxers that are coming after Prue for not boxing, and and that prideful and, and really arrogant captain, and and those are all very lonely positions to to have, and it really um, this idea of the lost and the lonely it really comes to head in a couple of instances whenever they uh, several times throughout the movie they sing that reenlistment blues song. Mm-hmm. And it's always right before a major plot twist, right? So they sing in this, this re-enlistment blues, and then um, Prue starts standing up for, for being the hazing whenever the guy kicks over the spit bucket onto him on the floor. And then, um, you know, they're singing the re-enlistment blues, and then uh, Maggio comes around the corner and dies in Prue's arms, you know? So it's always at the, that, you know, this idea of this, this major plot twist. And the very first lines of that song uh, were, I ain't no soldier no more. You know, so this idea of the lost and the lonely really kind of is that thread that ties it all together within this film. Uh, and it ties directly back to that, that one poem written you know, in the 1890s during British expansion in Africa. Um, so it, it was really cool that the author was able to connect those two literary pieces. Yeah, I think so. Kipling wrote the Gentleman Ranker poem within the series of the Barrack Room Ballads. I love the Barrack Room Ballads. Right. Gunga Din is, is, is one of my favorite poems of all time. But in that Gentleman Ranker, which I, I think the term exactly means someone who could be an officer because they are qualified through either education or social standing at this point, but is not, and they are an enlisted man for a certain reason, whether they've been demoted or they chose to be, which kind of plays itself in the movie. Um, But the poem, Gentleman Ranker, the line, we're damned from here to eternity. This whole movie is about like, what is right? What is wrong? You know, decisions people make. And I thought that line was, was a perfect perfect choice for for this movie and Kipling's you know I'm, I'm a big fan of Rudyard Kipling right. The White Man's Burden obviously The Jungle Book um, I think he's a little bit misunderstood <laughs> <laughs> but the, I was really excited when I started reading into where the title from this movie came from that was a really good connection uh, all you know, that you're was welcome re- <laughs> that was really really good um I'm not going to say I agree because I have no idea what you're talking about. So, <laughs> I highly recommend the back room, the barrack room ballads. It's right. a, it's so it's written in the vernacular mm-hmm. of I can't I don't remember what phrase it is, but basically he wrote these poems so the average person, the average soldier, could read them, yeah. and they're all from the point of an enlisted man, and they're about the monotony of army life. A lot of it has to do with like uh, v- late Victoria, British Indian. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, it was perfect fitting. <laughs> very, very cool. 
Well, uh, let, let, let's wrap this sucker up. Colin, did you like this movie, and would you recommend it? I, I liked it. It was cast a giant shadow after a, most war World War II films that came after it. So I think through no fault of its own, a lot of the, the characters and tropes, that, like, like Adam said, are very recognizable, some even seeming cliche, even though they were new at the time. So it's through no fault of the film that I've... You know, the I think some of the people we outlined of sort of the the bumbling officer, the you know insatiable woman, and the the absent husband, and uh, you know the wise cracking ethnic minority. Uh, it sort of became you know, you know, you know, you know stock uh, characters that you could insert into these you know plug and play for for these World War II dramas. But I think to see it just to get the references of where other movies are cribbing from, uh, and see it for Sinatra, uh, he's he's really great in it. He's I, I like him in Man with the Golden Arm better uh, as the the junkie uh, Frankie Machine, but he's He's awesome in this, uh, and uh, I got this role through his own merits. Everybody, <laughs> well, I, I, before before I pass it around, and I, I have to say, I agree one hundred percent. I like Sinatra. I mean, I, I like I, you know, I like his singing, but I was never a huge fan of his acting until I saw this movie, and it, I saw this movie many, many, many years ago. And um, you know, I think he is fan. This was his comeback flick too, because his career was in in a downward spiral. And, you know, after he got this role and he did very, very well in it, you know, his career started ticking back up. So, I mean, and he is fantastic. And Montgomery Clift is, in, is fantastic in everything he's in. And, and you know, Burt Lancaster is great in this movie, too. But, you know, Frankie is Frankie's outstanding. And Burt's huge. We were he talking is about massive. Yeah. So the wasn't v- it this taper? role that, um, that the Godfather, that, that mm-hmm. scene in The Godfather was... was it was derived from yeah, this idea that putting the a rumor, horse in yeah. the in yeah. the you know in the John, producer's head. Uh, Johnny bed. Fontaine doesn't get that movie, right? Uh, yeah. 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 So, but it's it's apparently been widely debunked. But who cares? You know, print the myth. You know. I yeah. think it's cool. Yeah, yeah. it's cool. It's totally cool. <laughs> it's, what about you, Kate? What do you think? Speaking of good old Bert, I highly recommend this movie. And it's we haven't really talked about the beach scene at all, but I would say that if you ask a random person on the street from here to eternity about the movie, that's actually the one scene mm-hmm. that they'll probably bring up. And I'll watch Burt Lancaster any day. So, yes. That's, that's an iconic scene. It is. Well, you know, Burt Lancaster, he was such an odd choice for this sergeant because he's, he's known as a, the big tough guy. And, you know, and in this film, he really shows a lot of emotion and a lot of, you know, compassion. And, and so it was, it was a cool choice. He's a tough it's, guy with a heart of gold. Right. Yeah. Right. What do you think, Adam? Do you um, like it? Recommend it? You know, so clearly the film hasn't aged well. <laughs> um, the, the pacing of it is, is god-awful slow. I mean, it's it's almost a two-hour film. Truth. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, you know, it's almost a two-hour film, but you see a lot of those really classic camera shots and those really really classic angles that just that make filmmaking just beautiful. It's a beautifully shot film. It's a uh, the acting is is magnificent. I mean, we've already said it, but but Sinatra does a wonderful job in this film, even though even though the mafia gave him the part <laughs> um, allegedly. But I, I can certainly see that it how it won what eight Oscars I think eight it won out of, 12, um, yeah. uh, out of the twelve nominations. So I can see how it completely swept the Oscars. I can see how it made lots of money. It's you know for it being a romance tragedy, like we've identified it. I guess um, it's it's a really well done film. I, I enjoyed it, uh, but. Like I said, I, I didn't really know what to expect at first because I had not seen this film beforehand. Um, but I, I, I would recommend it. You know, they almost didn't make the movie because Fred Zimmerman was afraid of making a movie in the McCarthyism era that portrayed the army in a bad light at all. So he was really hesitant, uh, I read, to uh, even make the movie. And yeah, the army and Navy hated it. Yep. Uh, they, they hated the film. And was Zimmerman ever blacklisted? Do we know? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I, I agree with everyone at the table here. I, I, I do like this movie. I've, I've always liked this movie. Um, it's, it's a good movie, you know, it, and it is, it does have its moments where it's slow, where it just, it does drag. But I think, you know, kind of reflecting on what we talked about here, especially in the beginning of this podcast, is that, you know, Army life in the early 1940s, late 1930s is, that's what this represents until, of course, the final few scenes. 
was monotonous and kind of slow, and I don't think they necessarily made the movie to be like that, but it's a good representation of what Army life was like. And that being said, uh, I do recommend it and that it, you know, the, the, uh, the attack on, on Schofield Barracks scene is, is really good. I think it's done very well. And I do think it portrays Army life, specifically Army life in Oahu before the war, very, very accurately, you know, with the partying and the carousing and the monotony and the boredom and the, you know, the drill, 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 drill. I think it does a, a very good job at that. And uh, with that being said, uh, Adam, final thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I, I like this film. It was great. That's that's it. <laughs> I thought the ending was actually really great as well. And the final thought, along with the final piece, you know, that everything that was once important is not important anymore because we're on the brink of World War II. And she didn't even think it was important to bring up the fact that they were talking about the same man. So I thought that was kind of a, an omen. And I thought it was good. Yeah. Colin? Uh, take a drink every time Sinatra does. You'll have a, have a great time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll sum it up with a quote from the movie. And this is from Pruitt. A man don't go his own way, he's nothing. And with that, I want to thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to hear more about the events we discussed today, tune into our mini episode next week. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Service on Celluloid. Be sure to rate and review us on Stitcher and iTunes if you like what you hear. I'd like to thank everyone who made this podcast possible, our producer, Tessa Jager, and our sound engineer, Jeremy Burson. This has been a production of the National World War II Museum.